There are some monumentally talented people working in the video game industry. Symptomatic of just how little the average consumer knows about the sheer level of stress, hours invested, and broad range of talents required to create a game in the first place, the medium tends to not be celebrated as much as film, where behind the scenes making of documentaries are commonplace. Recommended are Double Fine's phenomenal Double Fine Adventures series, showcasing how their own broken age went from idea to playable across many, many months, Danny O'Dwyer's No Clip channel that provides crowdfunded looks at gaming's most interesting stories, and Indie Game the Movie, where you'll find the histories of Super Meat Boy, Braid, and Fez. So far, so good, and they're certainly helping turn the tide, highlighting some of the industry's most ambitious and talented teams hard at work. But which are the studios that have never released a bad game? Be it because of a smaller pool of titles or just meticulous quality control over time, are your favorite studios completely spotless? From triple A's to indies and everything in between, the following examples aren't meant to denigrate the collective efforts of all developers, as instead, let's just celebrate the medium's finest. I'm Scott from Occulture.com, and these are 10 developers who have never made a bad video game. Number 10, Clay Entertainment. From Eats to Mark of the Ninja, Shank to Don't Starve, and especially Invisible Ink, Clay have been one of the shiniest examples of how experimental and worthwhile the indie scene can be for years. Just run down some of their choice cuts. Eats was a charming platformer, Shank instantly became a standout Xbox Live Arcade gem thanks to its Saturday morning cartoon look, then Mark of the Ninja proved the impossible and did one of the most feature-complete stealth games ever in 2D. Never content to rest on their laurels, Clay released Don't Starve, possibly the best, most pure survival game of all time, only to pivot again into Invisible Ink, a turn-based strategy with endless tactical experimentation and another killer art style. From risks that paid off to solid sequels and buckets of charm from lead artist Jeff Agala, Clay are still firing on all cylinders 13 years later. Number 9, CD Projekt Red. Okay, sure, look, CDPR have only released about four games, but man, just chart the arc of quality from the first to last Witcher. And that's not even saying that the first Witcher was anything close to bad, quite the opposite. The first entry in the franchise is literally the one that put CDPR on the map, showing gamers what the world of Andrei Sapkowski's books look like in 3D. Primitive though it may look now, you'll still find legions of diehard fans who first came on board through this release. Witcher 2 then amped everything up, fleshing out the production values from some substantial initial sales, actually seeing CD Projekt Red create two separate campaigns that trigger depending on which faction you side with. Assassins of Kings reined in even more lovers of their heartfelt design ethos, allowing the studio to put all of their money and expertise into developing the mighty Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. This became a landmark open-world adventure, remaining the best fantasy title on current-gen hardware, if not the best game of the generation so far. Oh, and almost as like a sure, why not, in their spare time, they released the Gwent card game, which honestly rivals Hearthstone and Magic the Gathering when it comes to building a deck and tactically dissecting your opponent. Number 8, Harmonix. Sometimes you come across a game developer that is absolutely ensconced in their passion of choice. With Harmonix, it's music, and they've spent their life's work creating not only some of the best rhythm games of all time, but software that actually encourages people to pick up and learn real instruments. Rock Band 3 was the nearest the team got to essentially making a plastic guitar replete with strings as well, but even their debut efforts frequency and amplitude provided a look into music composition, alongside how to get a feel for timing. And of course, there's Guitar Hero, quite possibly the biggest peripheral craze of the 2000s. Something that returned a few years ago for another go-around, but still represents one of the most important steps towards video games being accepted as a mainstream, living room-based form of entertainment. Game studios aren't often thought of as teams of musicians with orchestral, compositional brains, but harmonics really are that dedicated, just that cherished, and that damn reliable. Number 7, Blizzard. You can claim that some of Blizzard's older games don't hold up today, but to do so would be missing the point. This is a studio that always balanced artistic creativity with dogged, business-minded determination to make the biggest franchises possible. Overwatch is the most recent example of that, but look wider and you'll see the behemoth that is World of Warcraft, Starcraft, the loot grinder's dream Diablo, and the hour-stealing addiction of Hearthstone. Blizzard have everything from their own fan convention to a back catalogue with millions, a mentality that affords them the time to polish every last release to a mirror sheen. This mentality of quality over quantity existed way back when they were making side-scrolling Superman beat-em-ups and Justice League fighting games. Yes, really. And though they're unfathomably big now, it hasn't changed one bit. Number 6, Rocksteady. Talk about making an entrance. Only a select few knew of the fantastically overlooked Urban Chaos Riot response before 2009, but with Arkham Asylum, all that changed. Single-handedly ending the whole, can good video games come from movies discussion? The answer was always yes, to be honest. It was, it's the other way around that never works. Rocksteady's innovative combat system would go on to influence pretty much every third-person action game since. To this day, we're still playing games that have the whole rhythm-based mechanic behind them, yet putting Batman behind those punches in the first place made them extra special. 
Rocksteady challenged themselves to expand the Arkham formula and make it open world, scattering mission objectives and environments across a sizable chunk of Gotham. It split the fanbase right down the middle as to which style of game they preferred, a fractionating decision that, if you're in camp open world, was made even better in Batman Arkham Knight. The latter is easily the culmination of six years worth of talent and time investment, producing the ultimate Dark Knight experience. One where cleaning up Gotham's dark underbelly, busting out an array of gadgets, and facing off against iconic villains is all in a day's work. Number 5. Kojima Productions Passing out where Konami ends and Kojima Productions starts can be pinpointed to 2005, when Hideo Kojima's own team of developers was allowed their own independent label. But as a creative team existing within a larger developmental framework, they were still responsible for every main Metal Gear Solid, Zone of the Enders, Police Notes, Snatcher, and even the ace card game Metal Gear Acid. The hugely risky Castlevania Lords of Shadow also went down a storm thanks to having its heart in the right place, and experimental one-off demo PT slash Silent Hills became many people's 2014 game of the year. The quote-unquote worst the studio ever got was the Wild Guns-esque Metal Gear Touch on phones, but even that was playable and fun enough for a quick five minutes. Let's just go back to PT for a second though, I mean it was a demo, literally one L-shaped corridor filled with secrets and things to find through sheer repetition, yet it was so well made, so scary and so shareable, so recommendable, it outdid the vast majority of full releases. Now that really is talent. With Metal Gear, it goes without saying that not only did the first entry invent stealth mechanics, but Metal Gear Solid introduced a level of cinematic quality and framing to cutscenes that meant the industry would never be the same again. Here's to Death Stranding, and if any part of you is wondering if it'll actually live up to the hype and be any good, well, just look at Kojima Productions' immaculate back catalog. Number 4. Supergiant Games Another studio that take their time and emerge from years of development with the finest experiences around, Supergiant are 3 for 3, releasing the phenomenal Bastion, the aesthetically stunning Transistor, and their magnum opus, so far anyway, Pyre. All of these games came this decade. The best thing about following their work comes from seeing the connective tissue and lessons learned between games. Bastion started out as an isometric hack and slash twin stick shooter with a killer progression, only for Transistor to take that combat and apply a more contemplative, stop and plan then watch everything execute style mechanic. Visuals are distinct and stellar for both, but Pyre rolls these gameplay lessons into a competitive sport, establishing a story built around teams of excommunicated convicts attempting to win their freedom back by facing off in a future version of basketball. Across the board we've got such a strong, confident series of games. All stick to the most artistic tenets of game design and creative expression, resulting in titles that all feel distinct, lovable, and propulsive as to Supergiant's continuing upward curve. Oh, and composer Darren Korb should be a permanent fixture on any game music lover's playlist. That guy is awesome. Number 3. Naughty Dog To this day, Naughty Dog are one of the most reliable developers in all of gaming. We know their story, their characters, their work ethic, and ethos in general. They really care about what they put out, and though you can look to things like Uncharted 4 and Uncharted Lost Legacy as potentially needless sequels or spin-offs, the quality of those games far outweighs any criticism. Go all the way back to the start and you'll find the Mortal Kombat aping Way of the Warrior, alongside innovative RPGs Keith the Thief and Rings of Power, all before Crash Bandicoot blew a hole of pure charm into the side of the industry. Seriously, go check out Naughty Dog's 30th anniversary art book. Even they had no idea Sony were going to make Crash the face of PlayStation back when he was first being created. Thankfully, it all came together flawlessly, and we've enjoyed 30 years of hit after hit, franchise after franchise, with Naughty Dog moving on to new pastures at the turn of each generation. Crash Bandicoot became Jack and Daxter, became Uncharted, and now The Last of Us. You can chart the studio's maturity alongside their games, and it's a journey I'm sure we're all adoring every minute of. Number 2. Rockstar Games Rockstar's output has been nothing short of monolithic. Essentially going through their teenage punk rock phase with the earlier Grand Theft Autos, we saw a phenomenal step up as they released multiple new IPs and passion-filled experiments across the 2000s. GTA 3, Vice City and San Andreas led to Manhunt, The Warriors, the generation-defining bully. Even smaller franchises Smugglers Run and Midnight Club were used to perfect tight driving mechanics and open world traversal respectively, before feeding that data back into GTA, making GTA 4 and especially 5 something truly special. Today, GTA Online rakes in around $5 million a day from DLC and microtransactions, yet they come alongside a free base game, one stuffed with multiplayer modes, customizable homesteads, and high-octane cop chasers. What was once a hungry, ambitious studio has blossomed and flexed into a genuine entertainment powerhouse. The world waits with bated breath to see how Red Dead Redemption 2 will turn out, but chances are, it'll be fantastic. Number 1. Nintendo if we're talking about the sheer amount of products made versus median quality, Nintendo have the best ratio in the history of entertainment. I mean look, go on, try and think of an abjectly bad first party Nintendo game. Wii Music perhaps? For whatever hardware based failings it had, there were tons of youngsters for which this was essentially their guitar hero. 
the pure enjoyment of composing some original music far outweighing the bad. Go older and you'll find the NES is Urban Champion, a one-on-one -on -one fighter that sure has aged like a cheese sandwich in a landfill, but was damn fun with a friend, and mechanically tactile enough to just go with back in 1984. Flip to the positives and, well, Nintendo's first party high points speak for themselves. The Legend of Zelda, Super Mario, Metroid, Animal Crossing, Pokemon, Smash Brothers, Kirby, Yoshi, Star Fox, F-Zero, Splatoon. No other company has shaped the gameplay side of things anywhere near as much as Nintendo. And that seal of quality maintains to this day, even if they don't advertise it anymore. And that's our list. Let us know down in the comments what your favorite developers are that have never released a bad game. I've been Scott from Oculture.com. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe, and I'll catch you soon. Hey guys, thanks for making it to the end of the video, aren't you a star? Uh, don't forget to like, share and subscribe below, and also there's probably more content flowing up above my head, so why not check that out as well? Could be a laugh. Probably. 6 out of 10.